Eight years ago, when he exploded on the music scene, he took Indian popular music by storm. Whether it's films like Roja or Bombay, Taal or Dilse, or albums like Vande Mataram or Jana Gana Mana, the effect was stunning. But one big question has always remained. What is he like? What has his life been like? What makes him tick? Those are questions that up till now he hasn't seemed to answer. Well, let's see if he changes his mind today as you meet Allah Rakha Rahman. There's a big mystery, almost a secret about your personal life. Is that because you've deliberately kept it that way? Or is it because people have never asked you the right questions? I think the second one. People have not asked me the right questions. So if I ask the right questions, I might be able to open the box and get the secrets. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start at the beginning. You were born in 1967 in Mailapur. What sort of family were you born into? Uh, my father was a composer and uh, he was also an arranger and uh, my mom was an ordinary housewife and he was a workaholic and I think it was uh, what I'm going through now which he went through that time almost a hectic schedule kind of thing night and day work so music in a yeah. sense was inherited through your genes almost mm -hmm. now as you said your <coughs> father R.K. Shekhar was a musician was it film music that he was into? He uh, was into plays first and he was doing music for plays and then he assisted a lot of music directors, arranged for them. In those days music directors just had tunes with them and they needed an arranger to do all the background music and stuff like that. So he was the only person who did for mostly in Malayalam. And um, after that he did his first movie and unfortunately when, he, when the movie got released, the, the day it got released he died. Sadly, in fact, you were six when he first fell ill and he, he stayed ill for about two, three years. What happened? Uh, it was very mysterious, I think. Uh, they diagnosed it, I think it was like cancer and then somebody said it was voodoo and, you know, it was a very confusing thing. I, I don't remember much uh, since it was, I was too young at that time. Uh, but uh, we went through a lot of tough time uh, in my childhood. Your father's death when you were nine must have shattered you. Uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't get it that time because it, I was too young. And then I think it was almost when I was 18 I missed him. That's when I uh, uh, began to realize that I didn't have a father. It, it was about the time when you lost your father that your family converted to Islam, am I right? Uh, it was much later, but there was a Sufi uh, who was uh, treating him. But towards the end days of his, maybe a week or two before he died. And he later, uh, we met him later after probably seven or eight years later. And then that's when uh, we led another spiritual plot which gave us peace. So it was a process that started when your father was dying, but you actually yeah. converted eight, nine years later. Yeah, right. When you converted, you changed your name from Dilip Kumar to Allah Rakha Rahman. How did you choose your new name? Uh, my mother chose Allah Raka and uh, it kind of, uh, she saw it, I mean, heard it in a dream or something like that and then uh, Rahman was chosen by uh, the members of my family. Did it take long to get used to having a new name? The basic thing was, uh, I was almost working every day of my childhood and uh, it was like, uh, into the studios and going back to school and then after that, after finishing high school, I quit school and I started working from 9 to 9 and then uh, night 10 to 5 in the morning I did jingles. So it was almost like a, a intoxicated, just work, 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 work kind of thing. So you were never really conscious of yeah, the name? Yeah, conscious about anything. So when you changed from Dilip to Allah Rakha yeah. Rahman, the change didn't really matter, you just yeah, took it in your I stride. wanted something. Uh, I wanted to get out of that uh, uh, conscience and I wanted to get out of it and start a new life. So this thing helped me a lot. This was like I was, a, I, was a, I was a keyboard player and then I became a composer. So when I was a composer, I started becoming a composer. This helped me a lot to become more daring, rebelling. And so in a <laughs> sense, changing name, changing faith is a way of closing one chapter and opening another chapter. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the situation you faced when your father died. You were nine, as you say, the family was left in a bad way. How bad were things? Uh, <clears throat> you know what, without money, nothing moves in the world. And 
we, uh, he left over some equipments and stuff. So I was almost like a roadie, which they call to set up equipments for other people to play. And then my mom suggested that why don't you go full time into music and do it yourself. Did you have to leave school or did you have to do this at the same time as doing your studies? Uh, both. I uh, started doing it at the same time, which was so difficult at school because school people didn't know anything about it and they would shout at me, what the hell are you doing? Without attendance, how can you... They would uh, complain that you weren't yeah. concentrating yeah, because on they, studies. They were doing the duty and, and it came to a position where uh, I had to choose one of it. Then I chose music. So at, at what age did you then drop out of uh, school and choose music? When I was in plus one, I think. And then at that point, music took over. Yeah. Now, I know that in the early days, your, the articles that are written claim that you worked with some of the leading Tamil directors, including Ilya Raja. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. We, we, when did says work? What did that mean? It was, I think, uh, I started uh, full-time studio sessions, in, uh, the, I think, in 83 with a Telugu music director called Ramesh Naidu, then Raj Koti. Then I entered into Tamil with Leah Raja for one and a half years, and then MS Vishwanathan. Were you actually learning the trade and the profession, or were you Almost, working? yeah, kind of absorbing everything. At first hand? Yeah. At the same time, of course, as doing this work, I gather you were also doing your own musical training, and it wasn't just Karnatak music, you also did a degree course at the Trinity College yeah, of Music. Yeah, uh, practical piano, Western classical piano. Yeah. And how, how, what did you learn, classical piano? Yeah, classical piano. Any particular... Uh, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Liz, Liszt. They remain favorites, I gather. Yeah, because I've played all the pieces, most of them. And the other thing that you were doing about this age in your teens was you were a member of several rock bands. A rock fusion and all the stuff. I, we had a, most of the uh, studio musicians, good musicians, we joined and uh, we did a pop band. Uh, we played in a pop band called Magic. It was just one performance and then later it converted into a fusion band. Shivamani, John Anthony, Jojo, and myself, and uh, Raja. And then uh, it was too... Uh, live performance was not too much, because we, we were all studio musicians. We uh, couldn't get used to that kind of schedule, because we almost each person had recordings, and it didn't go further. But we backed uh, El Shankar when he came to India, and he performed in India as a fusion. But, but the rock bands were just fun. You weren't actually professionally in them. Uh, both actually, we wanted to get into something new because since we are playing the same kind of music over and over and again, film music. Okay, in 87, you began, I believe, four, four and a half years as the composer of music for advertising jingles. Yeah. Did you enjoy <clears throat> that? Yeah, that gave me a, uh, I met completely new people with different attitudes and uh, that changed the whole perspective of me looking at music. Like uh, they would expect me to do big, do a Zamfir and uh, uh, do a Kenny G and do a Deep Purple, and then suddenly become uh, do a Kirtana, uh, and they would lo uh, want a Tumri. You know, so it, I was almost exposed to all the kinds of music which uh, kind of influenced me. I would say uh, to make what I'm doing now. What about the fact that in advertising you have to make a musical point within 30 seconds? Yeah. Was that an important lesson? Um, very much, because uh, especially in the south, when I was in Madras, most of the stuff was being made in Bombay, and uh, for it to survive, it needed to be extremely good, uh, without any, because we didn't have any names. Immediately, if it was not good enough, they would say, no, we'll go to Bombay and do it again, you know? So we had a much more a tough time in Madras doing ads than uh, I would have been in Bombay. Do you mean that as a sort of ads and campaigns you worked on? Uh, I think the major one was by Raji Menon, uh, it's called All Went Trendy. It goes, All Went Trendy, All Went Trendy, something like that. And the other major one which clicked in the south was Leo Coffee, I think, which was a uh, very Carnatic uh, interpretation of her. How did that go? Difficult singing it. <laughs> Hamid? Something like that. So while you were doing the advertising jingles, was the ambition to move on to grander, more comprehensive music being born inside you? <clears throat> In fact, no, because I was very satisfied and almost happy with advertising. Because uh, since I was into movies uh, for 13, 14 years, I wanted to get out of it. There are no more movies. I'm sick of it. But things changed. And there was a different generation 
of directors coming in like Mani Ratnam and that gave me a uh, hope to do movies back again. But the interesting yeah. thing is that movies weren't by any means an ambition. In fact, in a way, you were content with advertising. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take a break there because I want in part two to talk about the career you've made in movies and the sort of music you've written and the fact that it all happened, I believe, almost by accident. Yeah. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest is A. R. Rahman. Let's talk a little about the music that you've been making and that's made such an impact. It all began in a sense in 91 when Mani Ratnam asked you to do the music for Roja. But I believe the whole thing happened at a chance meeting. Yeah, we had this party of Mani Ratnam's cousin sister who uh, I just told you about this Leo Coffee ad which we did and that won an award and Mani was there in the party. It was surprised to see him there. and. Uh, that's when we first met and then I invited him to my studio. And then six months later he came. He took the invitation six months later and came there and said, uh, I might do a film and just let me, let me hear your music. And then he heard stuff. I said, OK. Then he said, give me some tunes. Then I gave him some tunes and I thought I'll reject all of them. Then he said, give me more. Then I didn't ask him anything, I gave him more. And he said, I like all of them. Then it was a surprise for me to uh, get an answer like that and we were supposed to start a film called Pirida Tada and suddenly he said, uh, you know, we're doing a film called Roja with producer K. Balachandra, the legend and that was a surprise again. I think it was a fate destiny oriented thing which happened. When you were making this music and in a sense identifying your style, did Mani Ratnam play a role in helping you decide this is yours, this is not yours? Yeah, because uh, since I was too much uh, involved in most of the film work uh, in South, my intention was to do something new, but I didn't know how to do it. I had certain parts of mine which were completely original and completely the sound which was Roja, and I had some parts which was not uh, original, original in the sense sound-wise. So he helped me picking up the right stuff and shaping up my sound which came out of Roja. You are very right when you say that original is the word to use to describe your music. If I were to say that its brilliance lies in the fact that it has on the one hand Western influences and on the other hand it is influenced by classical Hindustani and Carnatic music, would you disagree with that? Uh, a lot of people give a different explanation for music. One, some say it is just recording, it is not nothing, it is nothing. And some say it is just rhythm, some say it is tune, some say it is lyrics. So I wouldn't uh, classify my music as something. It's like water. It's a culmination by nature, and it's. Uh, you mean it's like the mixture of H2 and O, yeah. which together create. Yeah. That's I, almost I like saying say it's a miracle. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a blessing by God. Do you believe that? Yeah. Huh? Do, do you believe that in a sense your musical inspiration is God speaking to you? Yes, because every time you do a music uh, or you do a tune, you never know that. When you know that you're going to do something, then it doesn't come out well. It it it's almost like a replica of something you've done before or something like that. But when you're uh, like a blank paper, then when something fresh comes in, then you know instinctively that this is something which I never had before. It's come in, and uh, it's a surprise for me also sometimes. So in a sense, it's those moments of chance yeah. when you don't expect it, and yeah. suddenly you come up with it that convinces you yeah. it's God's doing. Do you believe in destiny and fate? I believe in destiny and I also believe that destiny can be changed uh, by prayers and most of all for music you need a peace in mind and you need a spiritual power to control things. You can't be, okay now I have to do a tune which comes on the charts, I have to do a tune which has got to become super hit in Tamil Nadu and Hindi. That's in a sense, that's, that peace that's has been given to you by God yeah. and religion. Yeah. That's why yeah. in your mind religion, music go together. Yeah. If your father the late Mr. Shekhar, were to hear your music, how do you think he'd have responded? I think he might have been happy because uh, I don't know anything much about him. I just seen him work like a really like a slave for all the people he, whom he worked. So, but he was uh, whenever I used to play in the studios, all the all the musicians had a very good vibe on him, and they. Uh, 
your father was the first one who pulled me into this field and ma he made me a musician. He made me sit there and when I didn't know music, he would give me money and then I started improving on it. So it's uh, from all these talks, I came to know that he's a very good person by heart and uh, I think it's a blessing of him and the soul's thing which... So along, along, along with your belief in God, the image you carry of your father remains an important musical inspiration yeah. to you. When but your mother, is a, uh, she's a big cri critic because when she heard uh, the first song which I did, Dille Chotas, and she said it's brilliant and she started crying. And she sometimes hear one of my songs and say, ah, that's too much. I have to pray that this song should become a success. <laughs> your music in a sense today is thought of by most people as very dependent on beat. And many people say that as a result, the lyrics can't be heard or they're ignored. How do you respond to that sort of comment? See, for each uh, film, it requires a kind of uh, sound. So for the film like Rangila needed more of youth and the film like Tal needed more of rhythms and melodies. Same way. But I believe that none of the songs ca uh, can survive without melody. There is a melody and there is a thought. But it's hidden sometimes and then you notice it later that, oh, there is a melody. And so in a sense, those who say that Rahman's music is all beat are simply unable to hear the melody. Exactly. I think they, they're able to feel the melody, but they don't know to identify the melody. I think because it's, uh, most of the songs are shaped differently. Let, uh, me, let me share a comment with you. Many people say that Rahman's music grows on one. The more you hear it, the more you like it. Does that suggest that in a sense its appeal is more to the head than the heart, more cerebral than emotional? Uh, I wouldn't agree with that because, uh, see, when you, when you have a rag and when you have a tune, and the tune goes in the same way which some old song had been done before, then immediately you like it because some kind of nostalgia is being affected and then you kind of get a liking to it and then you get sick of it. You say, I don't want to listen to it. I've had enough. But when you do something new, at the first time it doesn't attract you and a little later slowly you get, what is this? And then it doesn't go from you. So in a sense the unusualness a, needs time, time to for get you to appreciate the, it. Yeah, exactly. So when again people turn around and say, so much of his music sounds the same and they accuse you of being repetitive, you are in a way suggesting they haven't heard it properly. Yeah, I think so. But no one is perfect and there's some song which beyond me, I mean, uh, might have repeated some instrument or something like that. And when they hear something which is peculiar, like a recorder or a Irish flute which is not being used conventionally in Indian films, they immediately say, oh, it's, it's sounding like that song. It's not the melody, but it's an instrument which is being used again, the same in my music. Which so the sound is misleading them rather than yeah, the melody. Huh? Yeah. Okay, I noticed that in recent years, you've begun to do a lot of work that is not strictly within films, Bande Mataram, uh, Ekam Satyam with uh, Michael Jackson, and then most recently Jana Ganavana. Are you looking consciously for avenues outside the world of film? In films, we have a limitation of having just six or seven categories of songs like love song, sad song, and then a group song, a marriage song, and things like that. And when you have, uh, you get an idea as a music, as, as a musician to do something else, you don't have, you don't find a platform to do that. So that's when uh, I got, I started getting interested in doing an album. It also suggests that you're looking for new challenges all the time. Yeah, the, somewhere you, you're not complacent and you uh, go from square one again. And so start. do you get bored very easily with just doing the same sort of film music? Uh, once in three years, I get bored. <laughs> and so, once in three years, you feel you have to do something yeah. different. When you did, for instance, Ekam Satyam with Michael Jackson, you had to get him to sing Sanskrit lyrics and words. Is that difficult? Uh, he didn't sing it. He, I just interpreted it in uh, almost like a uh, like an explanation in English, which will be released after his album is out. Was that an interesting experience for you working with one of the world's, possibly the world's best It's very young strange singer? that when we're making the song and when I had the opportunity to meet him, I uh, missed it because I was more in, uh, interested in doing the song when Bharat and Kanika met him. And then when I was, the meeting was fixed, he had an unfortunate accident and his video was played when my concert was on. So he was there on the screen for the audience, but he was not on the stage. Another so instance? He, was taken, uh, he had. Oh, he was in the ambulance. And Another instance of fate intervening. <laughs> huh? I mean, the strange thing is you believe in fate. <laughs> yeah, very true. 
you're about to embark on perhaps, in a sense, the most ambitious venture of all. You're going to do a Western-style musical called Bombay Dreams with Andrew Lloyd Webber. How did that come about? It happened with uh, when Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber listened to one of uh, the Bollywood numbers on TV, maybe mine, I think. And then after a couple of years, when Shekhar Kapoor met him uh, to do the Phantom of the Opera, I think he uh, heard he wanted to hear, just to break ice, he wanted to uh, extend the conversation. I said, can I see some Bollywood numbers? And that's when Shekhar Kapoor played Chaya Chaya and Dil Se and the other stuff from my music. More accidents, more fate coming <laughs> into play, huh? <laughs> and uh, that's when I got a call from him. Which is, which you mean one day the phone rang? Yeah. And what happened when you picked it up? Uh, when I picked it up, it said, uh, Shekhar said, uh, I want you to talk to somebody. And I said, who? Just speak to him. I said, I'm Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> I love his music. I said, <laughs> it was quite a surprise. And then I met him later and he said, uh, uh, let me do a musical for you. I mean, let me produce a musical which I want young composers coming up and things like that. So the music is going to be entirely yours. He's not going to have any role in no. the music. And this musical, Bombay Dreams, what's the story? Uh, that's what we're looking for. We almost got one and we are working on it. And when does it happen? It will happen second half of 2001. And will it be in London or Delhi? Or uh, I wish it was Delhi, Bombay, London, Japan, New York. All over the world. <laughs> God willing. Huh? So you're really ambitious with this. <laughs> are you, have, you, have you got good vibes and feelings about it? Or are you a little nervous? And I was a bit nervous but, uh, until it started. But after everything started getting into place, and then I'm quite OK now. But it's a lot of hard work from all the sides. And have you in your mind got lead actors and singers? No, group? nothing. Nothing. It's all from scratch. So once again, as you said at the beginning, there's a piece of blank paper. Yeah, exactly. And you're waiting for God to fill it for you. Yeah, exactly. Huh? So those, those, those songs that you create will once again be Rahman's God talking to him. God willing. God willing. <laughs> You've been through this interview. We began by asking you that you don't talk very much about yourself. You're shy. I think I've, I've talked too much now. <laughs> Do you really think so? I think I should work now. But you've told us, you've told us for the first time on record what life was like for Ehar Rahman, the struggle, the belief in God. Up to now, these have been things that you've always hidden from the world. And hereafter, will we see perhaps a different Rahman, a more talkative, more communicative one? No. No? You're going to go she's more productive musically. <laughs> you're going to go back into your shell in a yeah. sense. Huh? Well, Rahman, I wish you the best of luck. The world is going to look forward to Bombay Dreams, and certainly I'm going to be one of them. Thank Thanks you for so a lovely yeah. interview.